Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in History. This is your co-host Marcus Grodi joined by Monsignor Jeffrey Steams. And hello, Monsignor. Buongiorno. Good to have you join us on this program, Monsignor. Um, you're reminding me that a year ago we were in Rome. Is that your little yeah. <laughs> your little fine reminder of that great experience we all had uh, when the oh, coming, wonderful. We coming home network sponsored uh, our first pilgrimage. Hope it's not our last, but it was our only one so far to Rome, and we had a, a really wonderful experience. And, and uh, I think when we were there, Monsignor, it was part of our experience that we confirmed our desire to do this program uh, on St. Irenaeus' Against Heresies. And we're going to pick up in today in chapter three, excuse me, book three, uh, and actually chapter 18 is where we'll begin. But before we jump into the text, and our goal is to finish book three today, uh, we had a question from a listener who is a Catholic and was wondering, since we're using an Anglican translation of this, is there a problem there? Is, is it trustworthy since it's done by a 19th century Anglican? Was he, a, he wasn't a bishop. He was a priest. Is that right, Monsignor? Glad to answer. Uh, glad to answer that question. Um, it's interesting that um, of the text, uh, English translations are available to us. Um, the two principal ones are from the 19th century, uh, and uh, one is key, one is Keeble's, and the other is uh, the one that was produced in the Anti Nicene Fathers series. Um, done by a bunch of Scottish Presbyterians. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the two options were, um, you know, that kind of conservative Presbyterian approach <laughs> yep. or an Anglican approach, a high church Anglican approach. But it's interesting that we, I, I was just looking really quickly, there aren't any um, Catholic translations into English until um, just relatively recently in the, in the uh, um, early 2000s, in the an, uh, ancient, uh, or it's the anti the ancient Christian writer series published by Newman Press, um, we have a very very fine uh, translation of Against Heresies done by um, Father Dominic Unger, who was who is um, a Franciscan, um, and that's that would be the um, if you wanted to have a Catholic translation, um, I'd go to the Ancient Christian Writers series, but yeah. be prepared to spend a fortune for it. Because um, those books are, I don't think you're going to walk away from $100 because they're academic type titles. Yeah. Um, and, uh... there, there's, you know, uh, I think the only um, deficiency from our point of view, with um, with Keeble's translation, is that it is written in that kind of 19th century style, and it's it it sometimes reads awkwardly, um, but in terms of its accuracy, faithfulness to the text, I haven't found any problems at all as we've gone through here through this thing. And you know, one thing that. Uh, I think came out in you and I talking about another issue before this program that a reason that Keeble in his Anglo-Catholic commitment would not have had a problem with the translation of this because he's translating a father during the time of the church when pretty much Orthodox Catholic Anglicans would all agree on everything. That's right. So th there isn't anything that w he would have found in the writing Irenaeus, well, I'll, I'll pause for a second on that, that he would have felt the temptation to, to slip in the translation as you find in many anti-Catholic Protestant Bible mm -hmm. translations. He would have done that. In fact, when you look back in, in book one, when he's talking about the necessity of the Western churches to agree with Rome, he didn't flinch on that at all. No. You know, it's it is. I always found it uh, amusing um, how the. I, I guess Erdman's now has the copyright for the Anti-Nicene Fathers series, 
Um, but over the years, they've seen fit to produce both a Protestant and a Catholic version because the original Protestant translations, and it wasn't the translations, it was the, the footnotes. Notes, the notes, right. The notes were, um, were very, very Protestant in their, in their outlook. And, yeah. and so just to kind of lessen the impact of it, they produced a Catholic version that toned down the footnotes. You know, Monty, an, another thing about that, uh, the issue of the, the uh, why that it hasn't, the translation hasn't been available in English for so long in Catholic translation, is, um, is it true that one of the problems, if you will, with Catholic availability of English translations is that for the longest time, since most of these books were for priests or for theologians, the assumption was they needed to learn Latin anyway. So there was an, a, 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 an impetus to bring the Latin and Greek into English in the Catholic world. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair statement. And uh, most of the, I, I don't want to be derogatory about uh, English Catholic scholarship, but in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, you typically would look to the continent for the best work. So you find translations into French and German, but maybe less so into English from yeah. Catholic writers. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, eight-volume histories of the Catholic Church that's in English was originally written in France by a French scholar and then translated yeah. into uh, the Moret Thompson history, which I really like. And But we got the English version, it came roundabout. Um, so anyway... So to our, I guess to sum that up to our, our questioner that, yeah, everything's fine with this and enjoy it. Uh, and it's available free. There's the advantage on, online. You can get the whole PDF of it and print it out and, and enjoy it. So let's jump into the text, Monsignor. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, a section that you insisted that we jump into because of its importance, and that's on page 275, book 3, chapter 18. That's right. And, uh, and right in the middle of page 275, Marcus, are these words. Um, when, when he was incarnate and made man, he summed up in himself the long explanations of men in one brief work achieving salvation for us so that what we had lost in Adam, that is our being in the image and likeness of God, that we might recover in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to see uh, a little bit later in our podcast today um, when we get to um, uh, chapter 21, we're going to see him develop this argument, but this is, one of the most important and distinctive um, I, elements in St. Irenaeus' thought about um, developing a theology of the work of Christ. And it goes under the heading of the, of the doctrine of recapitulation. And it, it's based on, uh, particularly on St. Paul's letter uh, to the Ephesians, in, in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, where Paul says that um, in Christ is summed up. Uh, how does it, let me just look here really quickly. Um, um, in Christ, or God, God's will is to reestablish or to reunite all things in Christ. Um, it's translated in many different ways, but the, that, word for to, to reestablish or to reunite, or Irenaeus understands it as sums up, is, um, it's the Greek word is anakephaliosis. And we won't waste too much time with that, except it's, it's the English typically is translated recapitulation or recapitulate. And the idea being, the idea is a very simple one that with Adam, God's creation was disordered by sin. And, and um, we yearned and lived 
we yearn for the time when God, uh, through the gift of his son, would come into the world and basically renew creation, recreate creation, if you will. Um, and and this is, I, I don't know how exactly to put it, but it's it's a magnificent overarching view of the of the work of Christ's saving uh, activity. And it's we'll, when we get a little bit further into this text um, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll point out uh, how this has been brought into, um, well, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, for instance, emphasizes this a lot yeah, well, as well. That's part of our, part of the struggle of us trying to um, you know, finish book three as soon as we can so we can make our whole study reasonable. But there are so many sentences that deal just with what you've talked about in this section because we've gotten to the point in Irenaeus' argument where he's pointed out who these false teachers are, what their, what their teachings are. And then in book two, he, he takes them on apologetically, points out their flaws. And then in book three, he goes to the Gospels and the uh, epistles and, mm -hmm. and the characters within those to give their arguments in combating against that. And so right at that point where he's arguing to show that our Lord Jesus is God and what he has done, what he's, there's so much in here that it would be neat to read because we do recognize in the history of the church, when you ask that question, well, why did Jesus come? Why did he come? What did he accomplish? What does it have to do with my salvation? Uh, what do I have to do now? If Jesus did it, then what do I, I mean, all those big questions will be, will be debated for centuries after this. And Marcus, the not only is it the importance of um, understanding the work of Christ, but it's also um, this is also a key to how the church will develop a theology of the Blessed Virgin Mary as well, because she recapitulates as well, um, as we'll be talking about later on too today. Um, you know, just as Christ is the second Adam. Mary becomes the second Eve. So all that was undone by Adam and Eve's sin is is recreated by the faithfulness of the Blessed Mother and her son. If we look down to the next paragraph, he says, Thus, because it was not possible for that man who had once been conquered and thrust out by disobedience to be new molded and obtain the prize of victory. And again, it was impossible for him to obtain salvation who had fallen under sin. The son accomplished both, being the word of God coming down from the father and made flesh and descending even unto death and fulfilling the economy of our salvation. I mean, there he's, he's trying to bring it together and show that what what we couldn't do, what Adam couldn't do, Christ has done for us. That's right. And without the incarnation it, of God becoming man, becoming flesh, um, this couldn't have happened. All right. Um, let's, we'll move on to page 277. Again, those of you joining okay. us, I apologize. There's so much we're jumping over, but... We're just trying to pull some snippets out. If you're reading this on its own, don't jump over the sections that we skip because there's great <laughs> stuff in all those. But we're just trying to do what we can. So if we go to 277, um, I noted this one, Monsignor, because I, I just it jumped out at me. Remember, this is at a time in the history of theology where, as far as we know, we haven't encountered, encountered any writers that have said the phrase Trinity or one God and three persons, we're not there yet. So what we find in Irenaeus, he talks about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but he keeps everything very biblical. And in this little paragraph, he, he, he takes another glance look at the Trinity, not using the word, but looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating. He says this. 
He says, for in the name of Christ is understood he who did anoint and he who was anointed and the unction itself wherewith he was anointed. And as the Father did anoint, so the Son was anointed with the Spirit, which is the anointing, as speaking the, speaketh the word by Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me, signifying both, both the anointing Father and the anointed Son and the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful, that, and that becomes very important for what will um, develop in the next couple of centuries on the, the doctrine of the Trinity. That it, He's saying here that we can perceive um, the activity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the person of Christ. Um, and I, you know, I'm reminded of uh, when I was a graduate student, I spent those years working on the Cappadocian fathers and they emphasize, they were so en emphatic about how we need to appreciate that, um, that, that uh, we can perceive all the Trinity in each of the persons. Um, we can't separate them. And Greg, St. Gregory of Nazianzus had a, yeah, it was Nazianzus, had a great metaphor for that. Um, imagine you're in a large dark room and you put up three torches on the wall. And uh, so they illuminate the room. And now the question is, where does the light from one torch stop and the light from the other torch begin. And his point was, we simply cannot divide up the persons of the Trinity and isolate them from each other. It's, it's not possible. And uh, in some ways, going back to what Irenaeus has warned, that our curiosity would want us to take us beyond that. Because from a scientific perspective, I could probably answer that question. You know what I mean? Let's yeah. turn off the other two torches, and then I can I can draw on the floor the outline of where this one is lit, and then let's turn on the second torch and see its outline, and then the third torch, see, it, and then we can see where they overlap, and we we'll go through all that, and then it leads to theology, and you know when do the three overlap? Or they, you know, but Irenaeus is saying that the analogy is is a great way of showing their unity, but be cautious in your over desire to know yes. beyond what God has revealed. Yeah. And even this analogy here could be pushed too far. I was thinking in my mind as a, I'm a father that has had three sons, and I look back at a time when, when they were babies, I had to help, although I admit Marilyn did more of the bath bathing of the babies, but if I'm out there bathing one, well, I'm the bather, and I'm bathing my son, and I'm using water to bathe him with. So there we have, if you will, the anointing and the anointed, and then the uh, and then that which you anointed with. Okay, well, it's, it's a bit like St. Patrick trying to describe the Trinity to the to the pagans in Ireland. You can get you can use analogies that go too far, and so just we're, we're trying to use human images to describe something that's really beyond. Yeah, our yeah. ability. That's right. But this was the first sort time like I. The old yeah, the old three-leaf clover idea of the Trinity. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, is yeah. very, very limited in its usefulness. Yeah, ice, water, liquid, and vapor. You know, water is all three things, solid, liquid, and vapor. So there was a Trinity. No, nah, that's... Yeah. We, oh. If anything, they point out the mystery of, of God's creation as he expresses himself in his creation. Um, but there, we just have to be a little cautious there. All right. Thank you, Father. Let's jump to um, 280. Oh, we're jumping over a whole bunch of things I've underlined, but that's all right. We got to go. We got to move on. 280. Um, he's dealing with the topic of adoption. Section 7. There. Uh -huh. And he writes, And thus, as we said before, he hath bound and united man to God. 
For if man had not overcome man's antagonist, the enemy would not have been fairly conquered. And on the other hand, were not God the giver of our salvation, we should not have firm hold of it. And except man were united unto God, he could not have partaken of incorruption. Thus, it became the mediator, mediator between God and man by his connection with either side to gather both into fellowship and concord. And while he presented man unto God, to make God known unto man. For how could we be partakers of his adoption of sons had we not received from him by the Son the communion which is with him? Had not his word made flesh come into communion with us, through which we cause also his past, he passed through every age, restoring all to the communion which is with God? Yes, it's and it's. Um... I, I'm I'm deeply moved by that. I, I I just just think about what Irenaeus is saying here that it is because of Christ's humanity, his sharing in our nature, that we can be in communion with him, and through him, to be brought into communion with 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 God the Father. And I I was Marcus. I'm reminded of. Um, Oh, I, it's probably about three or four books into St. Augustine's on the Trinity. Um, he says, we go through Christ to Christ. And what he means there is you think of the two natures of Christ. We go through Christ, through his humanity. And because he is perfectly united, we go through him to Christ in his divinity and there we come into fellowship with the Blessed Trinity because they are one substance. And it's just a it's just a beautiful way of accounting for how it is that we are brought into full communion with, with the Blessed Trinity. I'm having an interesting reaction to this because there's a voice in me that's saying, That's there's nothing profound about that. That's just what scripture says. <laughs> Well, that's the point. That's what Irenaeus is. He's, he's, that's he, right. That's he, right. He's holding the scripture. And uh, Keeble on the side has a, a reference to Galatians 4. I think that's 5, my uh, reading four. glasses. Yeah, 4 or 5. And what does that say? Well, beginning with verse 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. Yeah, I mean, that's what Aaronaeus is doing, his love, yeah. his love for Scripture. And again, the other transition that I that the major transition that he makes from Paul is that when Paul's talking about scripture, he's talking solely about the Old Testament. But when we move to Irenaeus, he is fully sold out to the New Testament documents as the equal of inspiration yeah. with the Old Testament documents, which form the foundation for the authority with which he is speaking so strongly in this. All right. Anything else in that section, Monsignor? No, I think I think you got the key point there. Okay. At the bottom of page 281, and then carrying it over to the middle of 282, it says this, For to this end, the Word of God was made man, and he who is the Son of God, Son of Man, that man blended with God's word and receiving the adoption might become the son of God. Now, Monsignor, talk about that little statement because he, the translator, Keeble, uses the word blended with the idea of God becoming man. Well, look, Any thoughts on that? Down, there's a little footnote about that too, isn't there? Yeah. Um, uh, Choresis, um 
uh, receiving into him communion um, then mingled or blended. Um, I take it simply as um, that the, the, our lexicon or the, the old lexicon, those words were, they could mean different things. Um, but the, the main point is speaking about the union of divine and human in the person of Christ. And that it's blended means that it's perfectly united. And the reason, again, this jumps out at me as fascinating is because knowing from history, the next 150 years is going to be a real problem on that very issue. They're already He's already That's, dealing with it. Yeah. Is Jesus really God or did God just kind of, you know, adopt Jesus, you know, come into Jesus and then be with Jesus until before, just before he was crucified and he slipped away? I mean, is he, or was Jesus fully God, fully man? So here he's using that word, for want of a better word, blended. Blended, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, when we get into the fifth century and everybody is debating about the person of Christ and the nature of the union, you know, they develop this way of speaking about how you can, what you say about Christ and his divinity applies to Christ and his humanity. They're blended. Yeah. I think the word is perichoresis. <laughs> um, and it basically, you know, you can see the roots of it in what St. Irenaeus is writing about here. The the big debate. And, or, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and what what what's Irenaeus' burden is that he's running around dealing with these heretics that say that there's Christ who comes from heaven and then there's this really nice guy named Jesus of Nazareth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're buddies for a while, but then the Christ from heaven just leaves them and goes back home. <laughs> yeah. You know? And on the one hand, and I've made this argument, and so the weakness of my argument has been that Irenaeus often says, don't go beyond what God reveals. And so how God and man fit together in Jesus is really beyond our ability. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the danger is that there are real conundrums in Scripture that we have to somehow answer. And that's the idea that he emptied himself. In Philippians 2, you know, not, not, not holding, not grasping on to divinity, he, he emptied himself to become a slave. Well, how, how, how do you how do you describe that? In other words, if God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, a spirit, and becomes a physical being that isn't those qualities, how do you blend them together? And that'll become the debate in the next 150, 200 years after yeah. Irenaeus. Yeah. That, that wonderful hymn comes to mind. He he could have called 10,000 angels. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, if we jump down the next middle of the page, I, again, I found this one a very important statement given the time. Yes. Because Irenaeus says, For that no one at all of the sons of Adam is called God in the same sense as he is, or named Lord, we have shown from the Scriptures but that he, in the proper sense of the words, apart from all men that ever were, is God and Lord and King Eternal and the only begotten and the incarnate word and so proclaimed by all the prophets and apostles and by the Spirit himself. I mean, there's a very clear statement with doing nothing but quotes from Scripture, affirming mm -hmm. that Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. and, and then that paragraph goes on then to speak of his humanity. Please. Uh, how, that, toward the bottom of the page, how that he is both a man, uncomely and apt to suffer, and sitting on the 
on, on the foal of an ass and is drenched with vinegar and gall and despised among the people and descended even unto the dead. Um, he's both. Yes. Yes. And, and, and go on. And yet also yeah. the Holy Lord and the wonderful counselor and fair to look upon and the mighty God coming to the clouds to judge all. All this I say, the scripture prophecy concerning him. Uh, for he was man that he might be tempted, so that he was also the word that he might be glorified. I mean, we're actually entering a whole section on which he is, he is really emphasizing the fullness of Christ's divinity and humanity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is probably the first time that we have an extended conversation of this in the writings of the early church fathers. So this is very important for that. And I don't know what the phrase is, but you know, Father, but I think Newman used it. In other words, the doctrine isn't defined until, what's that phrase? Uh, uh, you know what I mean? So um, before Irenaeus, you have, you have first Clement and others, but they're not yeah. fighting the same battles that Irenaeus is. And so Irenaeus is, if, if you will, He's pushed to make these arguments in a way that Clement wouldn't have needed to, or Polycarp a little earlier. That so yeah, that that doctrinal definition is occasioned by by some heretical challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, boy, there's so much good stuff here. Let's but let's jump over. Go ahead. Did you have just want to oh, just just before we leave two eighty three yeah um, second paragraph in section three I just may I just read it yes please he therefore the son of God our Lord being the word of the Father and also son of man became son of man in that he had his human birth of Mary who had her origin from among men who herself also was a human being. I just love that, and it just it says what we've been saying. Um, both Son of God and Son of Mary define the two natures of our Lord. And later, I think it's at Ephesus or Chalcedon, I can't remember, Monsignor, where the issue of Mother of God, Theotokos, becomes the be issue. Ephesus. Ephesus. Council of Ephesus. Ephesus. Yeah. And the issue— the issue was not so much about Mary, but the issue was about Christ. That's right. That's it's right. the very thing he's saying right here. He's making the connection of God, the Son of Man, who was born of the human Mary. You know, so you know, you know, making that argument. You know, and how do you define who's Mary then? Is she mo just mother of Jesus? Is she mother of the Christ? Is she mother of God? If Jesus is God. You know, there was the debate. Yeah. Yes, because um, yeah, in that argument, in that debate, uh, it was Nestorius of Constantinople that had suggested that, strictly speaking, we shouldn't call Mary the mother of God. Strictly speaking, we should call her the mother of Christ. And and behind that is this idea that the two natures of Christ aren't truly united. Hmm. All right. Okay, let's let's do if we can, unless you see something in me. There's so many underlying things of, of goodness here, but um, I know you've been chafing at the bit to get to page 288. Yeah, maybe start at uh, 287. Okay, please do. So um, this is this is. Um, this is complicated stuff. It took me several hours just to work through this section. <laughs> um, I, but I'm utterly fascinated by it because what, what's going on here is, in fact, Marcus, I was haunted when I read this because I've heard this in modern liberal theology um, that, you know, that prophecy in the book of Isaiah um, um, is doesn't refer to a virgin, it refers to a young woman. We meet up with that same issue right here. Um, <laughs> it's a, 
he's Irenaeus is talking about the mistranslation of Isaiah seven fourteen. Um, untrue, therefore, is the interpret. This is on the in the middle of page two eighty seven. Oh, right at the beginning of of yeah. chapter twenty one. Yeah, that's right. Untrue, therefore, is the interpretation of certain who venture thus to interpret the scripture. Behold, the damsel, the young woman, shall be with child and shall bear a son. As Theodotus of Ephesus translated it and Aquila of Pontus, both of them Jewish proselytes, whom the Ebionites following say that he was born of Joseph. Therefore, to the best of their power, they undo this so great economy of God, making void the witness of the prophets, which is God's work. I just, I mean, just to give you a little background on that. So the Ebionites were that group of basically Jewish, it was a Jewish Christian sect that, um, that said that Jesus was an ordinary human being, period, full stop. And we should just love him for that and yeah. listen to what he does and say says. Um, so uh, the way they get around that is to argue that Jesus was born of a natural birth between Joseph and Mary. And their basis for doing it were these two men um, that Irenaeus names here, uh, Theodosian of Ephesus and Aquila of Pontus. These were second century um, writers that, the second century in, of the Christian era, writers that um, were translating Hebrew into the Greek. And when they came to this passage in Isaiah 7, 14, they um, said, it doesn't say virgin, it says young woman. And so uh, right here we've got I mean, Irenaeus has done his homework here, yeah. and he identifies the the source of this um, this heretical idea. I just was, I just blew me away. And then you know, um, so then you know, I, I just go just to push on a little bit more. Um, well, let me pause there the, then before you oh, go yeah, on okay. because because it, yeah. it, it is fascinating. I want to make sure. Yeah. that that I, I see it also, because the issue is even today, you go into any bookstore and there's 16.2 bazillion translations of the Bible. Which one do you trust? Which one do you trust? Right. And, you know, the devil tried to stop it at first, and then when he couldn't stop it, he used ridicule. When that didn't work, then he had arguments. But eventually he floods the market. With everything, so you don't know which church or which which Bible or you know which whatever you know because the market is flooded of opinions. So there's the question here: which translation do you do you hang your hat on, and how do you know which one's authoritative? Thank you for that good setup. <laughs> so you know, in the next on the next page in page uh, two eighty eight, section two. Irenaeus goes on to discuss the origin of what we call the Septuagint, that um, authoritative translation of the scripture, the Old Testament scriptures into Greek. And for the first, you know, four centuries of the church, that was, that was the Old Testament. They didn't read from the Hebrew, they read from this Greek translation. Um, and so he talks about how it all came about. Um, Ptolemy, um, of, who was the ruler, Ptolemy II was the ruler of Egypt um, in the year 285 to 247 BC. So we're you know, almost 300 years before Christ here. Um, and, uh, and he's, he's um, Speaking about, Irenaeus speaks about this, I guess we call it a legend today. Um, how, why do we call it the Septuagint? Well, these 70 biblical scholars from, from Palestine um, came to, they were brought into Alexandria because there was a huge Jewish settlement in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, 
Ptolemy wanted to, he wanted the Hebrew scriptures accessible and he wanted to put them in the great library of Alexandria. And so we have um, that story of the 70 comes to us from Philo um, of Alexandria, who's, you know, a very important um, person. When, or When did Josephus. Philo write? When did Philo write? I can't remember the um, dates. Well, he would have been, Philo would have been in the first century. Um, After the fall of Jerusalem? After the fall of Jerusalem, I oh, think. Okay. I, I, Sorry, I... You caught me out uh, yeah, on that. I'm sorry. I'm but he's sorry. basically I... contemporary with with Josephus, who is, you know, yeah. writing about that time as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they were they were the sources of, of what Irenaeus is writing about here. But I love how he speaks about how the ruler Ptolemy brings all these scholars in, all these translators in, and then right in the middle of the page, 288. Yep. He separates them from one another and have bade them all write the same passage translated. And he did it in all the books. Uh, and when they came together in Ptolemy's palace and offered for comparison each his own translation, both God was glorified and the scriptures proved truly divine, all of them having set forth the same things in the same sentences and the same terms from beginning to end. So that was kind of the wonderful way that we're assured that the Septuagint is an accurate translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Got 70 translators agreeing, working independently. And to, I think he really bases a lot of, he takes it seriously, that that really was oh, a yeah. work of God to say that yeah. this is a translation. And as far as we know, when you look at the New Testament, Nearly every time the New Testament writer quoted the Old Testament, he was quoting the Septuagint in the original every time. source. Yeah, every. until we get to St. Jerome. Right. We're going to pause at this point. This episode turned out to be twice as long as usual. So next week, we'll pick up with part two of Run Unto the Church. Hope you join us then.